Thank you everyone for joining and welcome to the 27th Inspiration Exchange session. Uh, my name is Fergus Imri and I'm a postdoc in the Van der Schaar lab and will be hosting today's session. Um, I just want to thank the other organizers, uh, Tennyson Liu and Professor Mahela van der Schaar. I'm excited today that we'll be discussing and showcasing a number of papers from, from our lab that we presented at the upcoming AI Stats and iClear conferences in over the next couple of weeks. And today we will have three speakers presenting four papers. Nabil Sida, who will present his paper about self-supervision and conformal prediction. Sam Holt, who's going to present two papers, where the first is on reinforcement learning and the second on symbolic regression. And last but by no means least, uh, Tianison Liu will be presenting his work on generative modeling with graph neural networks. If you have any questions, please, for any of the speakers at any point today, please do ask questions in the Inspiration Exchange channel on Slack, and we'll put the link to join that if you're not already a member in the chat now. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass over to our first speaker, Nabil, for his presentation. Okay, so hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nabil Sirat. I'll be presenting our paper, Improving Adaptive Conformal Prediction Using Self-Supervised Learning. And this is joint work with Alan Jeffers, my co-authors, Fergus Emery, and Mihaela van der Schaar. So as we all know, machine learning has really started being deployed across many settings in society, from making clinical decisions in medical settings, from self-driving cars to criminal justice. And a key thing when we're using machine learning to make important decisions is we really want to reflect uncertainty. And this is a huge challenge in the machine learning community that we really want to try address. And beyond just simply reflecting uncertainty, we want to reflect uncertainty with significant amount of guarantees of what this uncertainty actually means when we make decisions. And that's the key problem that this paper is really trying to solve to really make machine learning more trustworthy through the lens of uncertainty. And when we think of uncertainty, what we really want is models need to know what they don't know. And in typical machine learning, we might have point estimate models. For example, we have a model F, which takes in X, and we produce some output Y, which is just a single estimate output from the model. And imagine you are a decision maker who's using this model. If you just have the single point estimate, one is often quite perplexed of whether to even trust this prediction or not. And particularly when you want to take a decision, should you actually use this prediction in the first place? And that's where, from a trustworthiness perspective, we desire point estimates to be augmented with actual uncertainty. And in this work, we specifically look at prediction intervals. And how is this actually enabled? And this is broadly the area of uncertainty, and this is broadly the area of uncertainty estimation. And in this work, we focus on a very powerful concept of uncertainty estimation called, con called conformal prediction. And so what is con conformal prediction? For those who don't know, the key goal with conformal prediction is in the regression setting, which we target, is we want prediction intervals with guarantees on coverage. And by this, we mean that the true value will be contained within the interval with a very specified probability, which the user can set, as you can see on the screen in red. And what makes conformal prediction really special is that it's a very powerful method, as not only can we do this in a model agnostic manner, so users are very free to be flexible in their model selection and can use even different types of neural networks to more conventional machine learning models to even more mechanistic type of models. In addition, we have very few distributional assumptions beyond one which I'll cover on the next slide of exchangeability. And a brief primer on conformal prediction. So we start out, of course, with our typical point estimate model that we might not trust or we're quite perplexed of how to deal with this model's output. And the first thing that we do is we compute what's called a non-conformity score. And this measures the degree of strangeness of a prediction. And in a regression setting, for example, one might think of this as a mean squared error of an actual prediction. We then define a calibration set, which is a hell of a bit of data that the model hasn't been trained on. And then in addition, what we do is we compute all of these non-conformity scores, for all examples of the calibration set. We then take all of these scores we've computed and we sort them from lowest to highest. And here's where the magic starts happening. 
So for some user-defined alpha, so this is this probability that you want the interval to take on, we actually define a quantile value that we want to specify. And what we do is we select epsilon, which is the one minus alpha smallest value to define the cutoff. And based on the computation of this epsilon, we are now able to transform this point estimate model into one with actual prediction intervals, which vary based on negative epsilon and epsilon. And what this paradigm I've just shown on the previous slide is something called inductive conformal prediction. So we start off here with constant width intervals. And all of these intervals actually do have guarantees on coverage, but one might, what one might notice is that in fact, we see a big challenge is that we don't reflect adaptivity. And by this, I mean, we actually want samples which we find easy to have quite narrow intervals. And we have samples which we find quite difficult to make predictions on should have quite wide intervals. And how do we actually enable this? And that's where the paradigm of conformal residual fitting comes in, which is much more adaptive. And it does so by actually fitting a conformal normalization model in order to adapt the interval based on the difficulty of the sample. So now we are able to get smaller intervals for easy examples and wide intervals for, large, for harder examples, but yet still maintain our coverage guarantees. But what happens when we don't have a lot of data in specific regions? That's where conformal residual fitting or CRF might often be quite inefficient in regions that are sparser and we don't have a lot of labeled data. And that's where our work self-supervised conformal prediction comes in. We aim to improve efficiency, particularly for these sparser regions, particularly by leveraging unlabeled data, which we might actually have access to in many settings. So how does this actually work to improve efficiency? And the idea that's the big one in this paper is can we leverage self-supervision and unlabeled data to improve adaptivity? And the answer to this question is yes. We show that not only can we always access self-supervised errors at test time in any scenario, because you can simply compute it without needs for a label in the first place, but we also show that these self-supervised errors are inherently valuable and provide an important signal for the uncertainty on the main task. And this really allows us to improve adaptivity of the intervals that we produce. And now diving into our method, self-supervised conformal prediction itself. So we start off with the predictive and self-supervised step, which is our first phase. So that's this phase there. The second is the conformal normalizer phase. And the third is the conformalization phase. I'll delve into each of these three coming up next. So the first is starting with the predictive and self-supervised phase. So as normal, one can train your predictive model F on your labeled data set. And this is a conventional training procedure. We might have an encoder E, which represents some representations that we have from the model. Now we want to do self-supervision. And our key desideratum is that we want the self-supervised error to reflect the error on the main model itself, such that if one cannot do the self-supervised task well, it means that one is likely gonna make an error on the true predictive task or the main model's task. So in order to enforce this property, what we do is we transfer the encoder for the, to the self-supervised task itself. And now we train a self-supervised predictor H. And by coupling these two, we can be more confident that errors on our self-supervised task will actually be reflective of errors in our actual predictive task. So now that we actually have this in place, we now move on to the conformal normalizer phase. As I mentioned in conformal residual fitting, we fit a residual model or conformal normalizer sigma, which you can see in the purple block. And we actually want to augment this input with our self-supervised input and really make this model produce better residual estimates in order to adapt our intervals at a much more efficient level. And finally, we then can do the conformalization phase using the calibration set as normal, but now we've actually got a much better conformal normalizer due to the augmented self-supervised input. And now putting all of these together, we actually get adaptive intervals, which maintain our coverage guarantees, but at the same time, we actually adapt to the difficulty of the sample. And this is based on the multiplication of this epsilon, which was our original non-adaptive intervals with our sigma x, which is the output from our conformal normalizer. So let's look at how it actually performs in reality. So SSCP does produce more adaptive intervals compared to the current state-of-the-art methods. 
So the first is imagine we have a lot of unlabeled data. How does this actually perform? So we show that the, by adding the unlabeled data and adding the self-supervision, we're able to improve the relative width of our intervals, make them a lot tighter while still maintaining our guarantees and particularly seeing huge performance benefits when we have not a lot of labeled data. So at very low proportions of labeled data, we're able to actually leverage this unlabeled data and the self-supervised signal to improve performance by reducing interval widths. But imagine in many cases, you might say, well, I don't have unlabeled data. Well, SSCP still works in that respect. We can actually repurpose our actual labeled data to perform the self-supervised task and improve this conformal normalization model simply by performing the self-supervised task on, act on your labeled data itself. And this still allows you to produce intervals which have much narrower widths and are able to maintain our coverage guarantees. So on this slide, I've shown you that SSCP includes conformal residual fitting, but please take a look at our paper as we also show work on conformalized quantile regression in the paper. So our contributions are that self -super we show that self-supervision really improves residual estimates, particularly in challenging and much more sparser regions, and that SSCP provides more efficient prediction intervals, both for CRF and CQR. And where we see SSCP really fitting into the pipeline is we improve uncertainty estimation itself, but this is really fundamentally a key building block towards more trustworthy AI systems, especially when we want to deploy AI in highly high stakes and key decision-making settings. We'd really love for you to engage with this work and we really thank our sponsors. Without all of this, none of this work would have been possible. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sam Holt and this is Neural Pass Control for Continuous Time Delayed Systems. This is a joint work with my excellent co-authors Alihan Jaji Howe and my supervisor, May Lavanda Shah. So let's start with a small recap. So, Reinforcement learning methods uh, rely on costly trial and error approaches performed either online or in a realistic simulator of an environment, which are actually not often readily available. In contrast, we actually look in this work at offline model-based reinforcement learning, which learns in environment dynamics from a previously collected data set of state action trajectories, which is often readily available. It then controls the system to a desired goal using any suitable planning method, such as training a policy or using model control. So we look at, in this work, the first method to tackle more realistic environments, which are continuous time environments with delays. So continuous time environments in this context means an environment that has a inherent delay, which can be described by a delay differential equation with a constant unknown delay. And the offline data set of trajectories from these environments are normally observed at irregular time intervals, which means we need an inherent natural continuous time model to model these. Also, continuous, um, these environments involve a continuous unknown delay. In this case, we actually look at unknown fixed action delays. However, note that actually a fixed action delay is the same as a fixed observation delay, as prior work has shown. So some of the applications which this applies to in the real-world settings are, for example, an autonomous driving system, where it actually takes a delay before a deceleration force is applied once the brake is applied, or sunlight control, where communication link between the Earth and the satellite is actually observed at irregular times and there's an unknown delay. And healthcare, where the actual treatment effect of a patient is not observed instantaneously, it's observed in a delayed fashion at a later time point. And more realistic environments, such as business settings, where the project success of the project is often known to, at a delayed time and not known instantaneously. We present the first framework to address these problems, which we call neural pass control. It's a continuous time-based, model-based offline RL method that combines a neural pass dynamics model with a model to control planner. This gives the immediate benefits of being able to learn from an offline data set sample with irregular time intervals and has an inherent unknown constant delay. We provide a more accurate dynamics model for varying continuous time prediction into the future, and this enables actually uh, using any model with a control planner, able to plan at longer time horizons using a fixed amount of compute, able to plan at the same time horizon using less compute, achieves great sample efficiency, and we achieve state-of-the-art offline RL performance in these continuous time-delayed environments. 
So the method works in two principal steps. So given the offline data set from Jefferies, we learn a dynamics model. And then using this dynamics model, we use a model to control planner to plan and then uh, make an agent execute on the online environment. We'll look at the dynamics model first, because this is really the key to making this method work. So specifically, neural task control involves three main components. One, an encoder that learns to infer and represent the initial representation of the current state action trajectory up to time t. Two, a Laplace representation network that learns to represent the solutions of the state trajectory in the Laplace domain conditioned on the input state action trajectories. And three, an inverse Laplace transform algorithm that converts the Laplace representation back to the time domain. We also know that neural task control is preferable to nonlinear dynamics, such as nonlinear delay differential equations, as these can often be solved analytically in the Laplace domain through something analytically known as the Laplace ad domain decomposition. So we're diving into the details. So we actually just observe the action history and then the current state. Uh, and we encode these using two reverse time gated recurrent neural networks into a representation. And then we concatenate this representation to get an initial condition, which represents the future evolution of the state trajectory. Now to evolve this future state trajectory, we condition this into a neural network representation to learn this functional form that models this the Laplace representation of the delayed differential equation solution, which is represented as capital XS here. Now, such that when we take the inverse Laplace transform of FX, it approximates the future time solution well for future time. And actually, one common thing is learning Laplace representations as previous work has shown involves singularities. Therefore, we use previous work has shown a stereographic projection map onto Riemann sphere to mitigate this which is a previous work in ICML 2022. This stereographic projection is a bijection. So instead of modeling the neural network, we actually model the neural network on a sphere, spherical coordinates, uh, using the following bijection. Now, doing this mitigates the singularity phenomenon. And we learn a good Laplace representation. Now, given this Laplace representation, we can use any numerical inverse Laplace transform algorithm to then approximate future time points for t. And these normally provide work by true principal steps. So we uh, give the time points, they give queryable complex values, and these go into computing the um, numerical approximates of the future time values to approximate for. One really amazing fact about these things is that we can actually predict any future time using one forward pass through the network. And where, because the Laplace representation is actually independent of time once known, which is not the same for neural OD methods, which have to use numerical stepwise solvers to iterate and they increase computational for longer time horizons you want to predict for. So actually one key fact with this is we, now we use this uh, very more accurate dynamics model, we can then use any model to control planet downstream. We use the model predictive path integral, the MPPI planner, as this is stated out performance. And this computes a discrete action sequence up to a fixed time horizon. And each discrete action interval is defined as a delta seconds long. Now, the related work where the first method to provide a method that works on continuous time environments with unknown constant action delays. Now, doing these, we achieve state of the art results. And we can actually achieve near perfect expert policy performance when we actually learn this dynamics model when the offline data set of collected state action trajectories that is directly sampled and has an unknown constant action delay. Now, let's look at some of the insights here. So we can actually learn a good dynamics model. And if we plot this with the existing baselines, we see that for increasing prediction future time, we achieve a low mean squared error compared to the other comparable methods, which degrade their performance for predicting a longer time horizon. And actually, we achieve similar mean squared error prediction with various times of delay, inherently showing that we are learning a dynamics, which includes the delay as well. We can plan a longer time horizon using a fixed amount of compute, whereas it, you will see neural OD methods here use an increasing amount of compute to plan at a longer time horizon as they require more stepwise solvers and more forward iterations to the network, whereas we just require one iteration. And we can plan using at the same horizon using less compute as well. 
and we achieve actually still near expert policy performance doing this, which is good for high frequency systems like robotics or cars. And we also achieve quite good sample efficiency. In this case, I believe it's about 20 seconds of interaction time with the continuous time environment, and we can achieve near expert policy performance on a continuous time delayed environment such as Carpool. So the contributions are, we propose the first practical framework, which we call neural class control for environments that are continuous in time and have constant unknown action delays. We achieve state-of-the-art near expert policy performance with this, and we can quickly extrapolate to longer time rises for the dynamics model. And we're computationally more efficient for predicting the next state at a longer time horizon, thereby making APC feasible for longer time horizons for a fixed new budget. We hope this work provides a practical framework to advance offline RL methods for continuous time environments with delays, which are immensely useful and practical in the real world. So this is a, uh, a different paper as well, which we'll start. So this is deep generative symbolic regression. I'm Sam, and this is joint work done with my assistant Kofi Jani and my supervisor, Mehal Nandashah. So symbolic regression aims to find a concise equation F that best fits a given data set D by searching a space of mathematical equations, which is a task that is fundamental to scientific discovery. These identified equations more often have concise closed form expressions, thus they are interpretable for human experts and amenable for further mathematical analysis. For example, in the 17th century, Johannes Kepler, from looking at elliptical data of Mars, discovered his calculus laws, which should process took nine years. So bulk regression automates this discovery task, enabling the search today to take minutes. We will show actually our new technique can achieve the new state of the art for larger input variables, and they find these more efficiently providing a coherent framework. So fundamentally two limitations prevent the wider machine learning community from adopting symbolic regression as a standard tool for supervised learning. That is, symbolic regression is only applicable to problems with a few variables, for example, three, and it is computationally very intensive. This is because the space of equations grows exponentially with the equation length and has both discrete and continuous components, as we see here. We believe that learning a good representation of the equation is key to solve these challenges. Equations are complex objects with many unique invariant structures that could guide the search. Simple equivalence rules such as permittivity can rapidly build up with multiple variables or terms giving rise to complex structures that have many equation invariances. Importantly, these equivalence properties have not been adequately reflected in the representations used by existing symbolic regression methods. First, existing heuristic search methods represent equations as expression trees, which can only capture commutivity via swapping the leaves of the binary operator. However, trees cannot capture other properties such as distributivity. Second, pre-trained encoder-decoder methods represent equations as sequences of tokens, just as sentences or words in natural language. This sequence representation cannot encode any invariant structure as x1 plus x2 and x2 plus x1 will be deemed as two different sequences, as we can see here. Finally, existing reinforcement learning methods to symbolic regression do not learn representations of equations. For each data set, these methods learn a specific policy network to generate equations that fit data well. Hence, they need to retrain the policy from scratch each time new data set D is reserved, which is actually very computationally intense. So we propose deep generative symbolic regression framework. Rather than represent equations as trees or sequences, GGSR learns representations of equations with a deep generative model, which should excel at modeling complex structures such as images and local graphs. Specifically, GGS learns pre-trained and conditional generative models that correctly encode the equation invariances. The equation representations are learned using a deep generative model is composed of invariant neural networks and trained end-to-end -end using a loss function inspired by Bayesian inference. Crucially, this end-to-end -end loss, it was both pre-training and gradient refinement of a pre-trained model at inference time, allowing the model to be more computationally efficient and generalized to unseen input variables. And doing this, we achieve state-of-the-art accurate results across a wide range of small progression benchmarks. So the key idea is to use both equation and data set invariant aware neural networks. 
combined with an end-to-end -end loss inspired by Bayesian inference. Jujusa is the first and best to our knowledge able to perform gradient refinement of a pre-trained encoded decoder model using an end-to-end normalizing the square root error loss. And this really consists of two steps. So the first step is a pre-training step where an equation of data set invariant aware encoded decoder models learns a posterior distribution with parameters theta by pre-training, as we see here. Then an inference step that uses an optimization method to gradient refine this posterior and a discrete search method to build an approximate of the maximum of this posterior. Now, GGSR, again, is the first method to be able to perform gradient refinement of a pre-training encoder decoder model using this end-to-end -end normalized mean square loss. And we see related works actually are subsets of this more coherent general framework, which we propose. For instance, reinforcement learning just train a specific decoder and have to retrain for each new data set ever seen, which is computationally very inefficient and expensive. Whereas pre-trained encoded decoder methods use a cross-centric loss and represent individual equations as in the same settings as words, which require ever large exponentially increasing data sets to improve their performance. Now we achieve high recovery rate with more input variables, specifically with problem sets, and we achieve more state-of-the-art results, most actually being able to find the equations using less equation evaluations, and this is more efficient. And the performance increases when we scale to problems with larger number of input variables. So we see here the reinforcement learning methods and the pre-training encoded decoding methods. So this achieves a new state-of-the-art recovery rate on the SR Grand Truth benchmark when we tested it. The contributions for this work is that we hope this work provides a practical framework to advance deep symbol progression methods, which is immensely useful in the natural sciences. Doing so has the opportunity to accelerate scientific discovery of equations that determine the true online process of nature and the world. And to summarize contributions are, we can perform symbol progression on a larger number of input variables whilst using less inference to computational cost compared to reinforcement techniques, where DGSR framework enables end-to-end -end training of an encoded decoded model and uh, pre-training at time and inference time. And we can generalize to discover previously unseen input variables from those seen at pre-training time. We can correctly encode a data set to start from a good equation distribution lead to efficient inference and doing all this achieves steady out results across a wide range of symbolic regression benchmarks. We'd like to you to check out the paper here and also the associated papers. And we're excited to see what you can do next and extend symbolic regression to more real world settings. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tennyson and today I'll be presenting uh, our work titled Google, uh, a generative model for tabular data by, by learning relational structures. And um, this work was done with jointly with my co-authors, Jiaoji Chen, uh, oops, um, and Jeroen Beravut, and uh, supervised by Mihaila van der Schaar. Um, before we start, I uh, just want to briefly touch on the motivation for uh, developing a good generative model for tabular data. Um, generative models, uh, enables scalable approximation uh, of complicated high dimensional distributions encountered in computer vision, natural language processing, and speech. Uh, however, generative modeling for tabular data face a set of distinct challenges. And these include complicated relational structures. Um, so tabular data can contain very complex relational structures, uh, for example, sparse dependencies, where variables can only depend on a small subset of other variables, and very heterogeneous dependencies uh, that exist between subsets of variables. Uh, there is also the issue of overfitting and memorization. Um, usually these models are highly parameterized, which require large data sets uh, to appropriately learn the underlying distribution without underfitting. Uh, but tabular data sets are generally smaller, um, where collection is more difficult and requires more appropriate regularization. So I'm not sure why my mouse seems to just be clicking through stuff, um, but I apologize. And lastly, uh, there is uh, the challenge of domain knowledge. Um, so incorporating domain knowledge as though that's commonly encountered in medicine or social sciences is an important aspect, especially in practical settings where we can have smaller data sets, but expert knowledge about how these variables are related to each other. 
Um, on that note, current methods cannot effectively take into account dom domain expertise uh, to aid in model learning. Um, and next, we move on to examine what makes um, deep generative models successful in other domains. And we start with uh, where very well known successes in computer vision. So as we show on the screen, here we have an image. And uh, we know a priori that an in an image, there is a very strong uh, local covariance structure uh, in a local image patch. And we have these neural networks with convolutional filters that are specifically designed to extract uh, local and generalizable features. And if we move on to sequential data, uh, we have uh, temporal dependencies and autoregressive models such as RNNs, LSTMs, uh, and to some extent transformers as well. Uh, they encode these assumptions of sequentiality and learn effective representations in this way. Um, and then we move on to tabular data, which is one of the most uh, ubiquitous formats uh, that exists uh, in this world. And uh, we know that tabular variables that, that are usually presented in uh, this format have very sparse dependency structures. And um, almost all um, uh, deep models that are used to model tabular data are uh, multi-layer perceptrons, uh, which, as we know, encode very weak relational uh, inductive biases. Uh, where all variables can um, influence all other variables. And the question that we seek to answer is whether we can improve this. And the way we go about doing it is to incorporate these relational inductive biases that we know exist uh, directly into a generative model. Um, and we do so by assuming that the data generating process uh, behind a tabular data set can be compactly described uh, using a relational structure. And we aim to include the structure into the general process. So we have a relational structure, which is sort of illustrated here. And the nodes are random variables. And the edges denote the functional relationships that exist between variables. Uh, specifically, we say that each variable is determined by a variable-specific functional relationship. And that's uh, f. And we say that uh, f is a function that only, of a variable that only depends on the neighborhoods uh, in the relational structure. As such, we have. Um, uh, representation G, which encodes a sparse and compact representation of the data generating process. And if we want to learn uh, with this principle in mind, we immediately realize that there are two challenges. Uh, firstly, the relational structure uh, G is really, oh, I apologize again. So as I was saying, the relational structure G is rarely known, and learning such functional relationships independently is unscalable for data sets, uh, even with a moderate number of features. And as we shall soon see, um, we address these challenges by learning the relational structure explicitly. And we address the second challenge by parameterizing the functional relationships uh, using a message passing neural network. Cool. Now on to the main idea behind our method. Uh, so there are a few main methods, a uh, few main components, we, which we'll go through in turn. Um, first of all, we represent the relational structure using an adjacency matrix, uh, which we denote uh, G. And we say that in this adjacency matrix, uh, for example, entry G uh, IJ denotes the strength or the dependence between variables I and J. And we learn the entries in the adjacency matrix along with the other parameters of the network end to end using backpropagation. And then we have the set of functional relationships. As we said, um, the functional relationships should be defined according to the learned relational structure, um, such that um, during the generative process, we can generate variables according to the set of relationships that respects the underlying relational structure that we've learned. Um, the next step is uh, in parameterizing the functional relationships using a message passing neural network. And this new message passing network has a common message propagation procedure. So this addresses challenge two that we previously highlighted, as the flexible parameterization allows to reduce the learning of uh, these separate functional relationships to a common message passing network. Uh, lastly, we can introduce regularization as desired under learned relational structure. So this regularization can be used to encode prior knowledge, uh, for example, in situations if we know aspects of the relational structure a priori. It can also be used to encode sparsity, uh, for example, through an L2 norm, or to encode the connectivity of different nodes. Um, putting this all together, um, here we have an overview of the method. So Goggle is implemented using a VAE-esque uh, architecture, and the encoder is a fully connected network. 
and the decoder is a message passing neural network uh, which performs the gradual reconstruction of an input sample according to um, a learned relation structure. So the training objective is uh, that's the classic elbow objective and uh, there's an additional regularization term that is introduced that can be used to impose um, constraints or desirable characteristics on the learned graph. So on to a brief overview of the main results. We evaluated our method on 10 data sets, our real world tabular data sets, and we evaluated the synthetic data that it generated based on the quality, the detection rate, and utility. Uh, and we found that our method uh, outperformed existing works, uh, especially in a low data regime, and we attribute this to the more effective regularization and the more effective uh, use of the relational inductive biases. We also evaluated the effect of including prior knowledge on the generation of synthetic data. And we found a performance gain in notably uh, in quality as well as in utility and demonstrating that leveraging prior knowledge using our framework can lead to improved uh, modeling performance. Um, lastly, we visualized some of the learned relational structures found by our method. And while we have no guarantees on the correctness of the structures we covered, it is still interesting to look at and note the sparse relational structures that the model has uh, picked up on. All right, so in summary, uh, Google is a generative model that jointly learns a relational structure and a generative um, process to generate a uh, realistic looking synthetic data. Uh, we explicitly include a relational structure which allows prior knowledge and versatile regularization methods uh, to be used. Um, we encourage you to learn more about this method by checking out the paper and playing with the code. Uh, thank you for your interest in our work. And in closing, I would like to thank um, our sponsors at uh, the center and the lab uh, who have made this work possible. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tennyson. We're now going to be moving to the Q&A um, part of today's session. Um, and so there's been several questions asking the Integration Exchange channel on Slack. It's not too late to do so if you've not done so already. And um, we'll make our way through as many as uh, as many as time permits. I'll, I'll, when I call upon you, if you could unmute yourself and then um, ask your question to whichever one of us speakers it's directed to, and and then they can they can answer it for you. So I think we'll start with uh, Richard's question. Richard, do you want to unmute yourself? and ask, and I think your question is for Sam. Yes, that's right, it was for Sam. Um, so um, yeah, I thought it was a very interesting, set, and this was specifically about the um, the uh, uh, the deep generative symbolic regression work. Um, and, and it struck me when you were kind of going through the, pre the other work in that field, that one of the things that I've seen people do is, is kind of use these kind of grammar based or tree based um, approaches to, to constrain the set of equations to something that the things that are plausible. Um, and also I'm aware there's a work from a couple of years ago where they, they basically put weights on the grammar rules so that they could kind of, you know, they, they could effectively represent their priors about what they thought were reasonable, um, uh, you know, were, were likely places to find good equations, if you like. Um, so I was curious how, you know, whether, whether there's a way to do those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, the answer is absolutely. Um, and actually, we might say we can probably uh, do it better or similar to other methods. So let me um, elaborate. So as a standard in symbolic regression, you normally, as you rightly pointed out, you define a library of possible tokens you can discover from. So maybe um, multiply, uh, divide, log, exponential. And that really restricts the equations that you can discover, which are only composed of that token set. So by specifying the token set. And yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm aware of the work you, you mentioned actually about weighting the tokens. Uh, so we can, we can do that uh, implicitly here. So we evolved a pre-training um, step and then the inference step. And the pre-training step that actually is able to encode a prior by generating a pre-training data set, which can encode these priors mm. that you might have. So in this case, actually, what we, we did actually was to generate uh, synthetic equations with actually exactly right, these this probably distribution of different tokens. So we would say we want to see plus more than we want to see exponential or log. Um, so we actually do weight tokens. We generate maybe uh, I think it's about 10, 000, 100,000 different possible equations with this this distribution of tokens. We generate synthetic data from that, 
then we're pre-training on that synthetic data, and that kind of encodes the prior in the model. So therefore, when right. we the um, new data set test time, we actually have this kind of encoded prior in, already in the Jeep generator model. So yeah, that's okay. Weird. But but that does mean you'd have to do that pre-training each time. Each time you wanted to explore a, a new kind of phenomenon that you were trying to trying to fit equations to. Uh, yes, and also uh, not necessarily. Uh, we we shown in the paper we can also discover equations with that pre-training. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes more, sense. But if you uh, wanted yeah. to, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you wanted to always encode prior, we would recommend pre-training. That that would right. help. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Indeed. Fantastic. Thanks, Richard and Sam. Thanks, Sam, for that answer. I think the there's um, the next person to ask a question is going to be uh, Andre. I think if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, yeah. I think you oh. had a couple of questions for Sam. Yes. If you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. Uh, so my name is Andre, and uh, I work actually for Richard. We're both from AstraZeneca. So um, uh, yeah, yeah, that that was a, a very nice uh, presentation. Um, um, so my my questions are are more in a way practical. Uh, once you have the pre-trained model. Um, how much data do you need um, to to generate um, plausible um, uh, uh, equations and and then what kind of input um, are you able to get get from there? Are is it you know are you able to see you know top n uh, best performing models so that someone can take them further for further pro processing? Um, if you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, yes, we, exactly. We, we actually generate um, many, many different equations, and then we filter them by n top, and then we actually kind of work out a proto front where we find the uh, n best fitting models, but also a kind of most uh, least complex as well. Because obviously, you can find a model which has 100 terms, which overfits, but wouldn't generalize right. very well. Um, so, but, but uh, so yes, we that that's built in, and we leverage prior works that determine this preto front. And we think uh, we work about uh, 10,000. We produce a data set of about 10,000 equations on the output, and then we pick the best one essentially, um, which is on this preto front. Uh, so yes, there are many plausible candidates of equations, um, which which is quite nice. And actually, just on that, actually, we show in the paper that as other works have shown, um, generating these equations, sometimes we find equations that are generated where it actually represent the same functional form. We have um, uh, algebraic checks with SymPy to check for this, but when you actually look at the equations, sometimes they'll be mathematically equivalent, but actually different forms. So that, that's quite nice. Um, but yeah, you you mentioned it to apply to ODE models and data sets. So we we looked at supervised or regression tasks where we have input covariates and we have an output. Um, when you obviously ODE models, uh, unless I'm wrong, um, you don't really uh, see the differential um, representation. So you'd have to estimate that through using a pre-processing step like um, numeric gradient uh, differences estimation, and then you have to input that into the model. Because I suppose we we uh, yeah. It's just we have the y and then we have the x itself. Um, and then you mentioned, um, yeah, how much data is needed? So in the in the these simple cases, especially on some more regression benchmarks, uh, it's about a hundred data points, so maybe um, five covariates, and then one output. So um, quite small actually. Um, and then increasing noise. But uh, of course, um, some of these synthetic data sets don't actually have noise. So mm. with a hundred samples, you can discover it. Um, however, with noise, of course, the more samples reduces the noise. So it depends how noisy the data is and how much data you might need. So, um, but they can scale to more data sets, of course. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited. Those are the those have been the questions. So, with that, I would just like to to say thank you once again to our three speakers, Nabil, Sam, and Tennyson. Um, our next inspiration exchange session will be. On on May the 23rd um, and we look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible there so with that I'd just like to say thank you for joining today thank you once again to all of our speakers and until next time goodbye thank you <laughs>